Well, good morning. Welcome to our service this morning, online and in person. As we come in today, I want to share this from Tom Stephen, who says that no matter where we go in the world, people love to tell and to listen to stories. We enjoy entering into the life experiences of others through the stories, whether used to argue a point or interject humor or to illustrate a key insight, to comfort a despondent friend, to challenge the champion, or to simply pass the time. Stories have a unique way of finding their way into the conversation and the lives that we live. Stories are the language of the world, and we connect through stories. The most natural and powerful way that we have to communicate is through our stories. Good stories capture us. They draw us in. They, they incite our imagination. They help us to feel what the characters, characters feel. Their pain becomes our pain. Their victory becomes our victory. And we enter into stories to make them a part of our own experience. And I've even heard that our memories are organized into stories. So I want you to take a moment as we come into worship this morning. I want you to take a moment and think back to your childhood. For some of you, that's way back there. But go back and think of a story that you appreciated from your childhood. Could be a, a family story that had been passed on through generations or even of family members or maybe a favorite story that came from a book or maybe from a movie or your own even life experience. You have your story? Think about what makes that story memorable for you. Why do you hold on to it? Why, does it, why has it shaped you and impressed itself upon your memory and upon who you are? Now flash forward to today. Think of a story that has hung with you. Maybe it, from this past week, maybe from within the last five years, but something in your recent memory of a story or a movie or a book or a song or an experience that you've had. Same questions. What makes the story memorable? Why do you think you hold on to the story? And how has the story shaped you? These stories are important. They reveal different aspects of our life, of our relationships, of our faith, of our beliefs. Think about the favorite stories that we hold that we, that we want to sit to, to relax, to, to, to heal us in some way. In the book, Christ Plays in 10,000 Places, Eugene Peterson, the author of the message, says this. He says, story is the most natural way for us to enlarge and, to enlarge and deepen our sense of reality and listing us to, as participants. Stories can open doors to areas in our life and aspects of the soul that we didn't know were there or ways that we quit noticing because of our overfamiliarity. or suppose they're out of bounds. And so they, stories welcome us in. They bring us into a place where we get to sit around with the other listeners, those who are sharing the stories. Stories serve as a verbal act of hospitality. So as we continue with our storying and worship, as we enter into the stories of Scripture, I hope this encourages you as you think about the story that we share today. Good morning. Uh, Patrick, don't get too comfortable. Uh, before we get into uh, today's uh, story uh, message, uh, we want to um, bring to light uh, something that uh, we feel is very important in our lives, and it's you. Um, October was uh, Bless Your Pastor Month, and uh, we had shared uh, ways uh, with the congregation uh, to try and be a blessing in your life. Um, so I hope through uh, simple acts uh, as well as a, uh, a donation drive that we held in your name uh, among the congregation, uh, we, we hope that you felt a little extra boost, a little extra blessing in your life. Uh, and I'd like you to uh, come back up here for a minute. So uh, along with the Bless Your Pastor Acts, 
uh, the congregation held a uh, gift uh, fund uh, fundraiser um, through the month of October. And so this is the results of that. Well, thank you. Um, $380 uh, was uh, provided by the congregation. Um, and then also, since we met a certain fundraising goal, the uh, organization of evangelicals had a grant uh, afforded to them to uh, provide you with a $250 Amazon gift card as well to use as you please. So um, I please accept this token of our gratitude uh, for your uh, blessings to us each and every day uh, that we took a month out and, and uh, tried to give a little blessing to you as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. That's weird. <laughs> but thank you. Yes. <laughs> Patrick's personality is not one to accept gratitude. So that was very hard for him. So our story. Right now, we're going to continue our story through the Bible. We're going to start with a short video. In the first two minutes, give us all a chance to answer a question with a partner. After that timer finishes, the next part of the video will start right away, reviewing our last sessions. So find a partner and get ready, because this video moves really fast. Let's take a look back at our story so far. The Bible is a sacred story echoed to us from the ancients. An epic revealing the great creator's pursuit of fullness for all of creation. May we find ourselves in this amazing story. generations, the ancient Israelites told this poetic account of their beginnings. The Creator, 
a great and mysterious being called God formed the earth and heavens above. God's spirit hovered over the surface of the dark water. As God spoke, order was given to chaos and creation began to take shape. God pushed back darkness from light, separated sky from water, and surfaced land from the sea. God filled the air, land, and water with every kind of creature. Then God formed a new creature to reflect God's own image. Humans were entrusted by God to care for all living things. Looking over creation, God thought, this is very good. Then God rested and set aside a day in each week for humans to rest and enjoy being with God. God tried to keep up with humanity, but Adam and Eve ignored God's warning. They gave in to temptation, believing they could have God's good things right away. Instantly, their eyes were opened. They felt ashamed and afraid of being good and bad. Soon, pain, struggle, and death entered the world. Adam and Eve's first son, Cain, became a farmer. Their second son, Jealous rage, Cain attacked Abel, killed his brother Abel, and even after God warned them about the sin. So Cain was sent away to wander the earth. Before long, civilization emerged, but humans couldn't live peacefully with one another. Selfishness turned into hatred, murder, and war. The world was filled with violence and chaos, and God's heart was so God decided to start over and send a flood to wash it all away. But God gave Noah a plan to build an ark that would save his family and each kind of animal from the flood. Soon the floods came. Waters poured from the sky and burst on the ground for 40 days. Eventually, the water receded, and life on land was damaged. Suddenly, God stretched a rainbow across the sky as a promise of a new beginning. In our next story, God promises to bless the entire world again. It would all start with a man named Abraham. Let's continue the story. Our note card art is an important part of this story. It gives us space to express our own creativity, explore our questions, and capture the thoughts and ideas that these stories spark in us. Our symbol for this story, promise, is stars. When we each create our own version of this story's symbol, it helps us embed this image in our minds and helps get our creativity flowing while listening to the story. Here we go. Today, the Bible is like a disco ball. Dim the lights, turn up the music, and cue the disco ball. A disco ball does more than just set the mood. It takes one source of light and reflects it all around, off hundreds of tiny mirrors. What once was a single point of light is now a spinning array of light everywhere. The Bible is like a disco ball. As we listen and imagine, God's Spirit illuminates, radiating its truth and brilliance. Like the hundreds of mirrors on a disco ball, every Bible story reflects hundreds of insights that have meaning for our lives here and now. So let's dim our lights. Let's turn up to the story. Let's enjoy the rhythm of this ancient epic and let its light shine upon you. When you close your eyes, 
you can see a world come to life in your imagination. As you listen to the next story, pay close attention to the characters and the world that surrounds them. Let each, world you, let each word you hear be a reflection of the light that sparks your imagination. Let's prepare ourselves for the next story. Push out any distractions. Use your imagination to enter the story, seeing it come to life in your mind. If you like, whisper a prayer. Ask God to show you something meaningful from this story. Scene one, covenant. Generations after Noah, people filled the land once again. But humans, just like before, began to follow their own disruptive ways. They conspired to build a brick tower to the heavens to show that they were their own gods. Even in their rebellion, God didn't give up on humans. In fact, God made a covenant, a deep promise and relational bond with a man named Abram. God promised him, I will bless you and make your name known throughout history. Your family will become a great nation, and I will bless and protect. Through them, I will extend my blessing to the entire world. This was an amazing promise. But there was a problem. Abram's wife, Sari, wasn't able to have children. and They were both getting very old. She was 65, and he was 75. How would God bless the entire world through their family if they couldn't have one? God told Abram to receive my promise, leave your country and your relatives, and move to a new land that I'll show you. Abram and Sari chose to leave the safety of their homeland and follow God, even though they didn't know where God was leading them. After many weeks of travel, Abram was standing on top of a hill, and God told him, Look as far as you can see in every direction. I'm giving this land to you and your future descendants. Trees and green pastures filled the countryside. Abram and Sari settled in this place, which would be called the Promised Land. A few years later, Abram and Sari began to wonder if God's promise of a child would ever come. Abram asked God, What good is everything you've given me if I don't have a son to pass it on to? I'm getting old, and soon I'll have to give one, this to one of my servants instead. And God replied to Abram, I've promised you in Sari a son. Look up at the night sky. Try to count all the stars. That is how many descendants you and Sari will be blessed with. Too many to count. As Abram looked up at the star-filled sky, he chose to trust God, even though it seemed impossible, and God was pleased with him. Scene two, laughter. Ten years passed with no sign of a child. So Sari arranged for Abram to have a child with her servant, Hagar. This kind of arrangement was not unusual in that time and culture. After Hagar became pregnant with Abram's child, she began to hate Sari. Sari complained to Abram, This is your fault. I gave you my servant, and now she treats me horribly. And Abram replied, She is your servant. Do whatever you want with her. So then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly, Hagar ran away into the wilderness. As Hagar sat by a spring of water, she began to weep. And there an angel approached and said, Hagar, you must return to Sari. God will bless you with more descendants than you can count. They will become a great nation of their own. Your son will be called Ishmael, 
which means God hears. God heard your cries and cares for you. So Hagar returned and soon gave birth to Abram's son, Ishmael. But ten more years passed, and Sari still did not have her own child. Suddenly God appeared to Abram, who fell face down on the ground. God said, My promise to you will come true. I'm changing your names. You'll now be called Abraham and Sarah, which mean father and mother of many nations. Remember, I will always be your God, and, I will, and you will always be my special people. Abraham and Sarah laughed to themselves in disbelief. Abraham wondered, how can I become a father at 100 years old? And how can Sarah have a baby when she's almost 90? And Sarah thought, how can a worn-out woman like me have a baby? My husband is even older than I am. But God said, why do you laugh? Is anything too hard for me? You'll see. A year from now, you will have a son. Sure enough, a year later, Sarah gave birth to their son. They named him Isaac, which means laughter. After her son was born, Sarah giggled. Who'd have dreamed that we'd have a child when we were so old? God has brought us and everything, everyone who hears about this laughter. It had taken 25 years, but God's promise to give Abraham and Sarah their own son had come true. God promised that their family would become a new kind of people, called to extend God's blessing to the entire world. This family would be called Hebrews, and later the people of Israel, a name which means struggler with God. Soon, we'll hear more about why they were given this unique name. Pause for a moment. Let's ask a few questions. What did you see or sense in this story? Or what sticks out for me from this story? What sticks out to me, what stuck out to me whenever I you know, reflect on this story is actually an old pastor joke. Um, so, man was praying with God, and, and he says, and he asks God, you know, what, what's a million dollars to God? God says, oh, a million dollars? Well, that's that's just a penny to me. And the man said, okay, well, what does a million years look like to God? What, what's a million years to God? And God says, well, that's a million years. It's just a blink of an eye to the infinite. So the guy wises up. He says, hey, got any spare change? And God says, uh, give me a minute. Brunts. Next. Uh, what does the story say about you? What does it say about humanity? I don't really know which question this answers, um, but I think what... what the first thing that struck me is when you're reading your story and you're like, well, they left everything they knew. They left their family, their home, um, and then went to this brand new place. And the next words you say were, a few years later, they were like, what's going on, God? Um, mm -hmm. And that's a long time to wait. I mean, you leave everything you know, and you, I mean, the, the fact that it was a few years later, um, I feel like it, in my life, I'd be like, <laughs> a few weeks later, I'd be like, all right, now. Now what? Um, 
just being patient and, and waiting on God and knowing that things don't happen in my time. Um, and then the, the second piece of the story that kind of struck me, um, which I suppose answers the question maybe, what does it say about me is um, I can completely relate to um, Abram and Sari kind of taking measures into their own hands. They're like, well, we're just going to fix this the way that we know how to fix this, and this is what I'm going to do about it. Um, because it's hard to wait sometimes, and you think, well, I can do something about this and just kind of go on, go on my own direction and not, not wait on God. Thank you. So in what ways do you personally struggle to live in God's boundaries? Which of the characters in this story are you most like? Thank you. Uh, continue to uh, provide any, uh, uh, continue to pray on this or, or, or think about it and discuss it with God or, or with others. And uh, if, if something strikes you outside of this service, um, email us, uh, post it on Faith Life. Uh, we'll, we'll be sure to uh, keep, keep everyone updated in, in our growth. Thank you. When I have a chance to share uh, praise and petitions that folks may have, Jeff, you'll give me those that come on online, I assume. But if anybody here has any they'd like to share or know of any, um, uh, he'll be working from home and recovering and getting his full strength back. So continued prayers that that happens without incidents and that his uh, wife and daughter don't also get sick. We had an anonymous prayer request uh, come from someone in the community who uh, is struggling with some family and uh, marital frustrations and so um, prayers for that, that family. Any others? Okay. I want to lead us into a uh, liturgical prayer for the people, and then we'll follow with the Lord's Prayer. How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself from us? We pray with the faithful of the ages, praying that your kingdom will come. And we know that you hear our prayers and our praises, and we offer them to you. We pray that you would give those around us, the leaders around us, your justice and your righteousness that you'd help our leaders to lead in justice for all, to seek prosperity for the people, to defend the rights of the poor, to deliver the oppressed, to give the compassion for the weak and for the needy, to give us the strength and the wisdom to hold them accountable, to give us abundance, God, abundance of generosity to share with what, what we have with others, abundance of loyalty to goodness in the world, abundance of strength to hold leaders accountable. Give us grace and humility to acknowledge the shortness of our days and the falseness of our own thoughts, ideologies, and mindsets. Deliver us from falsehood. Make us children of truth. 
Give us honesty and inspiration to pass on the story of faith to our sons and to our daughters, to those that we come in contact with. Give them and all people a vision of your abundance. Strengthen us as we seek to bring comfort to those in the margins, to those who cry out in distress. And may we join in one voice that is shared through the ages the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jennifer. Good morning. Let's see, grab these. We'll just grab this one. I tried to find a large battery, but this is the, um, the object that we have for today. I don't know if any of the younger front, front folks here or young at heart want to come forward so they can see it closer. Then I'll just hang out up here by myself. That's fine. And those of you that are watching from home, got a nice C battery here, so... So today we're talking about batteries. Think about it, it's something that we all depend on in our life. Batteries are little power packs that let us run lots of different things without having to be plugged in to a stationary power source. We use batteries in all kinds of devices. Cell phones, wireless microphones, toys, and even cars use batteries. Think about all the things we have that use batteries. But then there's nothing more frustrating than playing with your favorite toy or talking on your cell phone or using a wireless microphone when all of a sudden the battery dies. It doesn't matter if it's the coolest phone, the best toy, the most expensive microphone. If the battery just goes dead, it's completely useless. So batteries remind me of something that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, in verses 1 and 3. Paul says, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. If you don't have love, you are nothing. Just like a toy or a phone or a microphone without a battery is, le- is useless. So kids, as you grow up, you're going to discover the talents that God has given you. You might be the greatest singer, the smartest teacher, the best athlete. But as you do, as you grow up and discover these talents, and even those adults out there that are listening as well, if you think about the talents that you have and the things that you do, remember this battery. Remember that you can show love to your family, the kids at school, teachers, adults. You can show love to coworkers and your family as well. Everyone you come in contact with. Because remember, without love, you're no better than a cell phone with a dead battery. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And thank you this morning for the words from Paul that remind us that we are just like a clanging cymbal, or in today's modern version, a dead cell phone without a battery, if we do not have love. As we go from this place today and we go out into the world, into our our daily lives, help us to remember the battery 
and to remember to show love to others. And Father, charge that battery within us so that we are ready and our eyes are open and our hands are ready and willing to show love to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. You want to have your communion elements ready? Feel free to get them prepped. I learned this morning the glue is not the same in all of these. This opened really easy for me. This is the first one in four weeks that has opened with ease. So, good luck. May the glue be forever in your favor. It's been a crazy week uh, in our country. I remember four years... Uh, coming through the election and standing up on Sunday morning and reminding us that there are Christians who are Republicans and there are Christians who are Democrats and there are Christians who are somewhere in between and some of us who are lost between a two-party system. And the reminder for us of what Scripture calls for us is to be careful that we bow our knee to a kingdom that's not the kingdom of heaven that we should seek first the kingdom of God, as Christ calls us to, above all things. Understanding that we live and have a responsibility and rights and freedom to operate within this country as we feel best. Faith Community Church is probably one of the few purple churches in Hamilton County. By purple church, I mean a blend of people who sit somewhere within the Democratic or Republican mindset based on where it is. And yet we're called to make sure that we, as Jennifer just shared, that we aren't clinging symbols. That we're not adding to the noise, to the frustration, to the pain, to the divisiveness, to the abuses that are put in this world in relationships and policy and in action. And that's hard work. No doubt some of you have been on an emotional roller coaster as we've seen things play out this week. And it's probably not going to end soon. The emotional roller coaster will continue as things continue to settle. And it's important for us to make sure that we step back and take an assessment. It's a great time for us to step back and say, what guides my thoughts? What guides my actions? What guides my vote? What's going to guide me in the next few months, the next year, the next four years? How will I work towards love? How will I work towards faithfulness? How will I work to the kingdom elements? Using discernment and conversation and engagement and above all, listening. It's not too different than the story that we heard today. We watched the election results play out and we saw that this margin is narrow. I mean, 50-50, on a thin line. And in the same way, Abraham and and, and Sarah, they, they had these dreams for family, for hope, for a future, for these promises that God had given. They, they were, were, grew into impatient and took things into their own hands, leaving Abraham with a son from another woman. And the division and the angst and the frustration that that caused, the the love divided that Abraham was forced to have to experience, to, to have to share some sort of affections between Ishmael and Isaac, between Hagar and Sarah. No doubt filled with, with distraught, frustration, anxiety, pain. And yet also feeling, feeling the flood of emotions of, of joy and elation and being proud in the future. The power of these stories that we're sitting in, it, they're amazing when we sit in them in Scripture because they speak so well to the reality and the situation that we are in today. 
that we run the risk of, of creating towers like Babel based on our own effort and our own uh, great decisive plans as we see it. While forgetting to be humble and realizing that we should be living for something that's bigger and beyond the reality of those things which are right in front of us. It's interesting that Abraham was chosen as one in this place with God because he was seen by God as one who was blameless and righteous. And he would, he would receive a relationship with God that would be based on blessing, blessing that he would take that which he had received from God and offer it for the sake and the benefit of others. And that as he sat in that relationship with God and as he sat in that relationship of of blessing others, of taking what he had to help bring joy or happiness or benefit to them, this cycle would continue. It would flow. And when we come into Jesus' story, as he starts his ministry in the Gospel of Matthew, he starts with a similar message. It's the message that we have in the Sermon on the Mount where he begins to address the blessed. Blessed are those, the Beatitudes we call them. As if Jesus is hearkening back, reminding us, remember who it is that God is going to bless in his kingdom work. Because we've gotten a little confused over time. That he's going to bless those who mourn, that he's going to bless those who are persecuted, that he's going to bless those who are poor. That's where the blessing starts. That's the place, the attention, the focus that he's calling his people to make sure that they're being attuned to that and warning us that we don't see ourselves in those situations, that we make sure that we don't put ourselves in the seat of the victim. We are the ones who get to carry the blessing, to carry the goodness, to carry the justice, to carry the restoration in that space. I want to share a song with you this morning, a video, and this may cut us out on Facebook um, because of copyright issues. We're not sure. So if that, if that does happen, I apologize. Uh, you can pull it up if you'd like. I didn't have it in the email because I would, didn't. No, I was going this route at that time that it got sent out, um, but the song is by the Bingsings, and it's called Keep Going On Song. But it talks this emotional roller coaster, this, this loss of where we are, and yet this reality that we must continue to keep going on. I, I would say it's not necessarily a church song, so be prepared for that if you need to, I don't know. But it does carry the heart of that emotion. And so as you, as you listen to this song, Reflect. Take some inventory of yourself, of where you are. Where do you see yourself in the story that plays out, both within the story of Abraham, the story that Christ gives us, and the story that's playing out in our country, in our community. Recognizing that we have brothers and sisters, at least half of them, that see the world differently than we do. Wherever we sit. And how will we listen? How will we love? How will we take a posture that helps us in this space to make sure that we are seeking first the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of the United States? So reflect on that in this space.
in the next few days, the next few weeks, in the next few months, in the years that are to come, I encourage you to keep going on. Because we don't know what we know. We don't know much. And when your emotions come, be it rage or joy or pain or whatever that is, use it in the right way. Make sure your emotion is not in the driver's seat. Make sure it's in the gas tank. Because our emotions should fuel where we're going. but should never be going. May you count your blessings. Do that over the next few weeks and share them. Share them here. Share them in email so that we can remember them in a few weeks as we come into our Ebenezer service. Check on one another. Okay with the first answer when they say they're okay. We're making this up. Some days we're figuring it out as we go, figuring out that day, the, the new range of emotions, the new range of experiences that, that we're experiencing with what that day has offered. And may we make sure that what we're planning within ourselves is the thing that has come from our ancestors, but is the thing also that we're planning for our kids for the future. Recognizing that this is a rough start. We're working with raw materials. And as we work with these materials, may we offer them to God. And may God find them pleasing as we join not only with him at this table, but we join with the other wandering souls who are trying to find space with one another in the kingdom of God. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took his bread, and he gave it thanks, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and after supper, he said, this is the cup of my new covenant and my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until I return. And so we proclaim the mystery of faith when we remember and we take part in his body and his blood. And we do so now. Do you have your drawings or pictures or images or thoughts, reflections that you have from the service? Share those with us and we'll put them on our wall as we continue to expand the story, this artistic story of the story of God as it unfolds. Continue to care for one another, to reach out, to not only love our own community, but to make sure that we're taking that posture of Christ, of learning what we need to do so that we may better love our enemies. Would you stand so I can offer you this prayer? 
May you walk out into the world with integrity and placed in your heart, knowing nothing of evil. And may our fears be replaced with the knowledge and the action of God. And may we seek first the kingdom of God to be faithful in our service to you only as we are faithful in our service to our neighbors, our enemies, and as others as we work for the day when the earth will someday be the land of the Lord. May God be with you. Go in God's peace.